Hi, this is Braden Holpe. Hi, this is Brian Burke. This is Kelly Rudy. Hello, everyone. I'm Carly Agro from Sportsnet Central. I am Jason Greger. Hi, this is Scott Hartnell. This is Quick Dick McDick. Hey, it's Ron McLean, Hockey Night in Canada and Rogers Hometown Hockey, and welcome to the Sean Newman Podcast. So welcome to the Sean yeah. Newman Podcast. I'm sitting with the... Uh, the man himself, Mr. John Nasty Morasty. How's it going, sir? Not too bad. Yourself? Yeah, doing real good. Well, we were just uh, talking before we got started here. Uh, you know, you played with Metal Lake last year. Actually, yeah. last two years, hasn't it been? No, nope, no, nope, just last year. Just last year? I, how, yeah, how just much, last year. How much fun was that? You know, as I really, I was, just, I was just telling you that earlier, I, I really enjoyed it. It was an opportunity to come home and, you know, for the last shit, Fuck, I'm getting old. The last 15, 20 years of my uh, – oh, should I ask, are we X-rated or no? Oh, yeah. Well, fire away. Okay. All right, on. So, no, anyways, yeah, like I said, last 20 years I've been kind of, you know, out and about throughout the world, you know, Russia and California and New York and Quebec and, and everywhere else. And I never really got a, to be home and play in front of my family and friends. You know, I had my, my close family would fly and watch me play and stuff. But, you know, the last, the last few years of my career was pretty far away. So it's always awesome to be able to have family. And even my younger girls that are still, you know, when I was playing pro, they were, you know, still, well, my daughter was, I think, one at the time. So she doesn't really know what I did for a career. So it's it's awesome to be able to have her come out and watch me play. And, you know, with the the Mustangs in Metal Lake here, they did a really good job, you know, with, with uh, before games, we let the, the young kids come out and ski with us. So my daughter, I think she was a regular. I think she, she came out pretty much every home game and got to ski with us and, so it was just a good feeling to do that. And then having you know, a lot of my family and, and friends from home come to the games and watch. And so it was a really treat, a good treat for myself. Well, I, I can safely say uh, being on the other side and going to war, what seemed like every game and go to triple <laughs> bloody overtime with you guys, uh, yeah. the fan support you guys get there is unbelievable. Yeah. Metal Lake's a real good hockey town. I mean, we got a lot of big name guys that come out of here. You know, you got the King brothers, you got myself, you know, you Blonsky, Jeff Friesen, Blake Coma. I mean, the list goes on for a small town. It's produced a lot of, a lot of good hockey players and, and guys that are, you know, were successful at the next level. So, um, you know, it's just, it's kind of sad to see, you know, as, as, as hockey develops here at the younger ages, we're losing a lot of our tier one teams and stuff like that. So, you know, uh, unfortunately, I think, I think the days of us developing a lot of good, good players is, is going to limit now because of that. But um, like I said, Metal Lake, they really love hockey and they, they, they follow us through our whole careers. Right. So, it's quite a treat. You know, another guy that I missed out was Mike Saklinka. You know, he played this year. And, you know, man, was it fun playing with him. And, and we just sit there and giggle and, and laugh, you know, when they're in the dressing room. So he was kind of my, my dressing room partner. And we just, and just enjoy the game, you know, and, and have fun and giggle. And, and I guess from my, from my aspect, I didn't really have to do what I did for my career. I didn't have to fight. So it was fun just to go out and have fun and tease guys. You know, like I tease you and say, hey, you want to try it? And, <laughs> You know, but for, for the most part, I'm just out there having fun and enjoying it and, and, and getting an opportunity to play and, and, you know, score some goals and, and just, just have fun. You know, I'm, I'm glad I didn't watch too many of your fight videos before you asked me that because I was dumb enough on ice to be like, nah, I'm, I'm okay, nasty. I, I'm okay. <laughs> but I yeah. watched a few again today and I'm like, yeah, that's like <laughs> about 12 belts above my head. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, a, it was a good career. I enjoyed it, man. It was fun. Are you, uh, you know, you've been bugging me. Are you back next year? Are you going to su suit it up for the Broncos again? Uh, I don't know, to be honest. It's like, you, like you said earlier, too, it's, it's time taken, right? And I have, a, I have a younger boy that's getting to the junior ages now. He played his first year junior last year. So I really like to watch him play now. And, and, and you know, my little girl, I actually volunteered to be a, a coach this year. If this whole COVID thing can fuck off, you know. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I'm hoping that hockey's a go. And, and like I said, I'm looking forward to coaching my little girl. And, and being there for her. So, um, I won't doubt, I won't doubt that I get the itch to play. You know, I, I played a little bit the year before too. I, but I didn't go till, till I think it was January. I got a phone call from uh, Grand Prairie in, uh, in Alberta. And I ended up playing, I think just, I played this the right amount of games to play for, uh, for, to make, to play in the playoffs. So I was actually flying for senior hockey. I was driving to Saskatoon, flying to Calgary, Calgary to Grand Prairie playing a Thursday night and a Saturday night game and driving home and um it was it was quite quite a quite a ride you know it was actually my old junior coach Wayne Labrie that called me up and said hey yeah I got a proposal for you to do it and so I think I played I think six or seven games prior to the playoffs just enough to get to be on the playoff roster and 
actually ended up winning that league. So it was a lot of fun, you know, a good group of guys there too. So he, he, the itch is always there to be in the dressing room. You know, I don't even think it's the hockey. I miss it just being out with the guys and being able to bullshit and, and have fun. Did, did you enjoy it? Like having a drive to hop on a plane, to drive to get there, to kind of play a couple of games, to hop back on, to drive, to fly, to drive. Like, geez, that's a lot of work. Oh, it, it was. But I mean, I did that for a while there, you know, like, you know, through my, throughout my, towards the end of my career, I ended up opening up Tim Hortons here in Metal Lake. And uh, so I ended up leaving my contract in Russia a little bit early. And when I came home, I was supposed to get this, the restaurant was supposed to open up right away. But because they said, oh, there's some delays, I ended up having not much time, not, not much to do. So I ended up getting a call back in the old Quebec senior league. And I was, I was doing that pretty much every second week. And I'd leave here, you know, Thursday and I'd play Friday, Saturday, and I'd fly home Sunday. And then I'd come home for, you know, 10 days and I'd do it again. And basically playing pro hockey, but living at home was quite a unique, unique, unique experience. But, you know, I mean, they made it financially worth it to do that one. I mean, that's a bigger league, right? So I was, I was making a good salary there doing it, but it was a lot of travel. I sure collected a lot of air miles. And you bring up the Quebec, like it is notorious for its, uh, well, I mean, we all see the NHL now and you see a fight, what, once every 10 games? Yeah. I, I don't know. They say Ryan Reeves is the heavyweight champ and that kid used to turtle everyone. So I don't know. It's a different league now, you know, <laughs> no, no disrespect to him, but it's, it's a different, like you said, it's a completely different league, you know. I mean, even, even in junior, I remember my junior career, I think my 16 years old, I went to, uh, the Kinder Street Clippers, and I think I fought 15 times in the weekend, you know, to make the spot. <laughs> and, and, you know, guys don't fight 15 times in their whole career now, so it's it's definitely definitely hockey's changed. I mean, it's a lot faster and more skilled, but I still miss the old, you know, the old time clutch and grab, big hits, and you know, pay, you know, where the guys kind of patrolled the ice themselves and had a lot more fun, I guess. Well, I was uh, listening to a different podcast of you today. A, you're kind of like, you must do like two of these a week, I swear. Because I like <laughs> searched it and I'm like, oh my God, like I can't, I can't get through this in, in a week uh, going at it steady. But the one yeah. that stuck out was a guy had added up all your fights and he had you at 297. Now that, that is pro fights. Does that sound yeah. about right? I'd say yeah, I'd be close to that. I mean, I, I, I honestly don't remember half my fights. Um, I shouldn't say I don't remember him, but guys say, ah, oh, you remember that fight? And then it kind of rings a bell, but, you know, there's been a lot of fights and maybe too many, but uh, it was what I did. It's made me who I am today. And, and, you know, it's good. You know, I don't, you know, I don't like when people put down fighters because most of the fighters that I played with straight from junior to pro or, you know, usually do the most within the communities and give back to the communities and to the youth. And, you know, to this day, I still give back to my, my first nation community and, and uh, yeah, but a lot of fights and a lot of videos and, I mean, you could sit there for hours and watch. There's guys that I didn't even know I fought. They said, oh, shit, I fought him. Okay. You know. <laughs> <laughs> did you enjoy it then? Did, did you actually enjoy dropping the mitts? Because, I mean, you're not – it's not like you're – you – I should say, you fought some absolute heavyweights. Like, yeah. just bears of men. And you're not a small guy, but, John, you're not, you're not six foot five. You're not strolling in and, and being yeah. George LaRock by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. Yeah, I ain't gonna lie. I, I I could I can actually say I loved it, you know. And uh, you know, with all the negative stuff on fighting nowadays, I I, I don't buy it. I mean, I'm not trying to hear sit out here and promote promote fighting and fighting's great for you and the hits that head are great to you. But you know, with a lot of the tragic losses that we've had in the past, I mean, those guys were fighting some some other issues as well. So I mean, it's 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 a, such a sticky topic. I've I've had reporters call me and want to interview me and stuff, and I'm not gonna by any means bash fighting in hockey. I mean, I think it still has a place for it in the game and, um, you know, but yeah, I, I, there's guys out there that tell you they love it because I think it's an image they say there and I'm not going to name any names, but I have even close friends that say, Oh, I love fighting. That's, I wanted to fight every second, but those, those guys I fought and the minute after we fought, we'd be in the penalty box. I say, okay, we'll go again in the second period. And they'd say no fucking way. <laughs> there's guys out there that say they love fighting and they, I don't think they really did. It's just an image they want to put out there. I can actually truthfully say, and I'm not trying to, you know, say I'm an animal thing, but I, I enjoyed fighting. It was, you know, I, I smiled when I fought. I loved it. It was, you know, I never been into really drugs or anything like addiction. So I think that was my addiction was fighting. It was the adrenaline. I mean, to this day, I still look for adrenaline. Like I would skydive, I'd jump off cliffs. I'd do, you name it, I'll do it if it scares me because I just, I love that, that rush. 
And uh, so, yeah, as, to answer your question, I, I love fighting. And, and like I said, I don't regret one bit. How, how many fights did you – what was the most you ever did in a game? Uh, I was actually – the Chief and I were just sitting here talking a couple of days ago about that. I was laughing. We were talking about chewing snuff. It was my first game in uh, the SJHL. I think I was 16 years old, and I was playing for the Kindersley Clippers, and we drove up to Flin Flon, Manitoba. And this is just one. This is a younger story. I mean, I obviously I had a lot of three-fight games playing pro in the NHL and the AHL. But uh, we were in Flin Flon, Manitoba, and it was the year that they just in, included the two-fight rules. So you were allowed to fight two times in a game, where before it was only once. And I was 16 years old, and I remember I went and got in a fight. In the first period, I fought and did really well. As a, you know, I was a young rookie. Won my fight really well, and got in another fight. And as I was getting escorted off the ice, some guy – said something to me that pissed me off so I grabbed him and fought him too so I had three fights when I was only allowed to have two fights in the SJHL and anyways getting on the bus that was not even what we were talking we were talking with chew and snuff and I remember you know as a rookie sitting in the front of the bus uh the older 20 year old vets you know said brass you get to the back of the bus you're a man now and you know when I look back at it they were just kids too but you know to me being a 16 year old getting called to the back of the bus with all 20 year old vets was kind of cool and all I remember is uh one of the guys said here have a chew kid and I put a, some Copenhagen in my mouth and thought I was the coolest thing in the world till about 20 minutes later, I threw up the whole way home. And uh, to this day, because that's why we're talking about chewing stuff, was to this day, I can't smell Copenhagen or I'll puke because it reminds me of that, that bus trip from Flin Flon, Manitoba, back to Kinder State. It was all because I fought three times and they wanted to tell me I was a man now. <laughs> <laughs> I bet if you asked, uh, let's call it 70% of hockey players, they yeah. all have their first chewing snuff story and i would say most of those result in puking and yep. most of those result in copenhagen short because you can't yeah. keep the damn stuff anywhere i never knew that you got drunk or, or high off of snuff and why was i dizzy so yeah i i can <laughs> i can probably say that was a long bus trip home and it wasn't wasn't the best feeling well you mentioned 16 and you're fighting in your first camp so yeah. was that something you were into at a young age then like were you not at all. Not, not to be honest, not at all. I was actually, you know, playing, you know, back in hockey's changed so much with all these academies and stuff. But back, back in, in Bantam, I was actually one of the leading scorers in, 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 in Bantam hockey. And I think we were playing in the center four hockey league in, in Saskatchewan. And it was a, a lot of good hockey players would always get drafted out of that league and, you know, go on to the Western league and then go pro. And uh, that one year I was, I was one of the leading scorers in the league. And, you know, I got uh, convinced to go to some junior camps at a young age and, and um, I had older cousins that were playing in the East Coast and stuff already. One guy's name's Leon DeLorme. I don't know if you ever heard of him. A uh, couple of those guys. And, and they were running, they were, you know, second or third year playing pro. You know, they're 20, 21 years old, 22 years old playing in the East Coast. And they were running these camps, when you know, these tryouts for the North Stars and, and Clippers and all that. And all they remember, they'd say, well, Rasty, that number 18 said you're a pussy and wants to fight you. Go fight him. And, you know, that's kind of how I got introduced to fighting. And, like, okay, I did good, you know, I think. Never really lost many fights in junior, and and uh, you know, then next thing you know, they're telling me they're going to put me in a billets house, and you know, so I you know go from being a first line power play guy in bantam to being a young 15, 16 year old rookie in junior and having to fight the 20 year old guys was quite quite wild. But I always said, you know, it was it was a blast, and I enjoyed it, and I was good at it, so I kept going. You know, I saw this year firsthand when you'd put the puck in the net, and I'd be like, "Was that Morasty again? Like, really? Was that Morasty? Because you had a you had a couple of I don't want to pump your tires too much, but you had a couple of beauties this year. I think it's yeah. everybody in the building that you still had it there. Yeah, oh yeah, I think that, and that's that's what a lot of guys don't understand. You know, they they look at the videos, they look at you know what you did in pro, and they say, "Oh, he's a goon," or you know, but. To, to get those those to those places that we've played, you have to have a little bit of skill. And, you know, like I always said, if you gave Sidney Crosby, you know, two minutes of ice time a game, he's not going to get that many goals, you know. So, you know, my, you know, when I was put on the ice, I was usually tapped on the shoulder to go do something, and I wasn't trying to score a goal. And I, I was either trying to hit someone hard or, or, or get in a fight and change the momentum or stick up for a teammate. So, you know, obviously come home and – being First Nation, I love to come home and play in the Indian tournaments and have fun and, and you know, show, show guys that you can play. And, you know, there's been times where I've led the tournaments in scoring. And it's just fun to show people that you're not there just to fight, you know. And, you know, sometimes people don't have, even know your personality and they think, oh, he's nothing but a, you know, mean guy. And sometimes you're, you're, you're the nicest guy in the world. People just see what you do, with, you know, on TV, right? So, I, yeah, it's, I, I enjoy what I do. How many times this year have you had uh, a guy want to try and challenge 
I, I I'd read an article. I'd read an article saying that some guys wanted to challenge you this year to try and make a name for themselves, and I laughed. I went, "Who in I the I, I, I read I read that article, and I think it was misinterpreted because I think Daryl Worm said that guys were trying to fight him, but there wasn't. I don't think there was one guy that tried to fight me, and I'd usually laugh when they would because I, I I wasn't there to fight, you know. And I mean, I I have nothing to nothing to prove and nothing to you know. I either hurt my hand or hurt somebody, and and what what does it what does it do for me? So, um, you know, I I don't know. I, I I think I read that article you're talking about too, and I I didn't really know where that came from to be honest, because I haven't had a guy challenge me at all to be honest. Growing up, were you a boxer? Did I read that too? I uh, as a young as a young kid, I think I was about uh, maybe ten years old, eleven years old. I like I, I like I told you earlier I wasn't a tough guy I actually got picked on lots you know being being First Nations but I look I look like a white kid you know I growing up on the reserve a lot of the Indian kids would always call me white boy and stuff so I grew up getting picked on and and having to stick up for myself so my dad put me in boxing and I actually ended up being really good at it and I became a Golden Gloves boxer I think three or four years in a row and what, uh, what, wait wait Golden Gloves bo- what is it, what do you mean I won provincial titles quite a bit and Western Canadian titles uh, as as a younger kid. So but, you were uh, throwing, you were throwing the, so th- when you got to uh, fighting then, you had some training behind it. Oh yeah, yeah I boxed, like I said, I, I didn't take it, you know, and then, but at that time when I got to be 17, 18, I know I was going to major junior camps and I couldn't box no more. That was kind of just a secondary sport to, to stay in shape. But, you know, that's a sport that really makes you be, uh, you know, conditioned and, and makes you really, uh, I don't even know what the word is, you know, but you have to be on top of things and always be. Um, structured right so boxing was a really good thing for me and I to this day I talk to parents and I say you know put your kids in boxing because you know yeah you have to put a lot of devotion into the sport and and uh, I mean it helped me I ended up having a pretty long good successful career from from fighting and and boxing was a a big part of that you know to help me train and how to take a punch and and how to and how to protect yourself from the bullies yeah how to protect your friends guy from the bullies and I guess now I was considered the bully (laughs) yeah so. What did you, was it was it a jump? You know, you talk about uh, playing in the SJ at a, at a young age. You end up playing in the dub, and yeah. uh, anybody around hockey knows the jump from. You know, there's there's top players in junior A, but the caliber of hockey is just an, another tier up. I assume the the heavyweights are another tier up. Was that an adjustment? Oh, definitely. Like I said, you know, but I, I took the long route to play in games in the NHL. You know, I wasn't a drafted player in the NHL. I wasn't a drafted player in the WHL. I kind of always went, I took the long journey, you know, so I remember being as a kid, I think the biggest thing that pushed me, and you said it earlier, I'm not the biggest guy. So I still had a lot of haters. I would always tell me I was too small. I wasn't going to make it, you know, and that's kind of what drove me to do what I did. You know, I, there's a guy on top of my head right now from Metal Lake. Uh, I played with his son and every time I'd come home, he'd say, oh, John, you're too small. You'll never make it. You know, and then that year I went to the SJHL and I think I had 488 penalty minutes and led the league. And I don't think, don't think I lost a fight. And then I come home that summer and, you know, he'd say, oh, you did good in the SJHL, but, you know, you're too small to play in the WHL. You'll never make it. Those boys are too big. And, you know, next thing you know, I get a phone call from the PA Raiders. I'm in PA fighting Steve McIntyre and Derek, you know, all the big boys there. And, you know, I'll come back and I said, oh, you're too small. You, you did it in junior in the WHL, but you'll never do it in pro. And, you know, it just went on and on. And then I went to the East Coast and did it. Then I went to the AHL and did it. And then, you know, I was fighting guys in the NHL. So I think that's what pushed me the most to do what I did was to have people that doubted you, you know. And I, like you said, I'm not a big guy. I'm 5'10". You know, I'm pretty heavy, 220, 230 pounds in my prime. But, you know, it's just it's just having that push to people to doubt you to, to, to prove them wrong. And, and uh, so, yeah, I, I did it. But as, as far as calibers, yeah, every, every league that I went to, you move up. You know, I mean, obviously the skill set's bigger better and faster and you know but I remember even going from the AHL to playing games in the NHL you know I always said it, it's a lot of those third fourth line guys are the same guys that are in the AHL that are in the NHL it's, it's your it's your Sidney Crosby's your Ovechkin's your goalies like Fleury you know it's those stars that really make that difference I mean I I, I played with guys that were third line guys in the American League that are now third line guys and you know in the NHL and, and it's, it's it's those star guys that really made that wow you know i didn't realize i didn't realize you played any games in the nhl who did you play for in the nhl i I I was in columbus yeah with with the jackets with the blue jackets yeah i played there and i think it was 06 and 07 or 07 08 so but that's like i said you know guys will say what what's the difference and and that was the difference that i really noticed was the rick like in, in columbus it was rick nash and 
you know, those, those big name guys that you're like, wow, look, look how good that guy is. And, and, uh, but you know, in junior as well, you know, you, you played with some, some, some guys that were first round draft picks and second round draft picks. And, and those are the guys that you really say, wow, those guys got skill, you know, but for the, for the majority of the guys, I mean, and then obviously the treatment flying on planes and, and being treated like this, you know, it's a lot more higher class celebrity status when you're, when you're playing games in the NHL than you are in the American league. So who is your, who is your uh, seatmate on the plane when you're flying? I think I, I can't even remember. I think it was, might've been, it was probably, I was probably beside Zen and Kanopka. Him and I were really close. Z Kanopka, you know, he was, he was a good friend of mine and he, he kind of had our skill set. You know, the year I was in the American league, we, we ended up, breaking the record for the most consecutive wins in a, in a, in a, in a season. And that year, I mean, we were like slap shot. We were the old school hockey team. I mean, um, we had, you know, myself, we had Zenin Kanopka, we had Derek Dorsett, we had Tom Sestito and basically no one touched our red line or there was going to be a brawl. And I mean, I remember our, our, our building being sold out in, uh, in, in, in pre uh, warmups, you know, our, our building to be sold out because people knew that something was going to happen in that game. And, and that was the year that, you know, to this day, I still get phone calls and, and people ask about the year. I think it was the 07, 08 year with Syracuse crunch where we, I think we were in dead last place at Christmas time. And we flew into the Chicago, I, the Chicago wolves were in Chicago. And I remember, I mean, and they were in, I think first place that time. And we ended up going in there and having a brawl and warmups and we ended up beating them five, nothing. And from that point on, I don't think we lost a game the rest of the year until the season, until the playoffs started. And uh, it just, like I said, we, that was, that was the year that we all talked about. Cause I remember we, uh, we were in, uh, we started a, a rule. I remember we said, okay, well, if we win five games in a row, we're going to let the entire team go out with, you know, cause in, in the American league, you don't have to wear your helmet and warm ups. You know, you always like to do that to look cool and show up to do, or you know, at that point I had a Mohawk and, so I, I always, I didn't wear helmets because, you know, I was, a, I was the designated tough guy. So I got to go stroll around with no helmet on. But I was also my first year in the American League. But we made a rule, me and Kanopka, we said if, if we, uh, we win five games in a row, we're all going to go out with no helmets on. So, you know, sure enough, we won five in a row. The entire team, all 20, 20 players were on the ice with no helmets on for warm-ups. And then I remember me and Z sat down and said, okay, well, what's next? And we said, okay, well, if we uh, – if we win 10 in a row now, so another five games, we're all going to go into warm-ups with no helmets and no shoulder pads, you know. And you got to remember, this is a pretty high-caliber league. And we were actually in Cleveland. We had won the 10th game, and our next game, our 11th game, was in Cleveland. And uh, Cleveland's really close to Columbus, right? It's only like an hour and a half drive. So I remember all the brass from the Blue Jackets were coming to watch us play because at this point, we were the hottest team in the American Hockey League. We had won 10 games in a row. And I still remember Scott Housen. He was the general manager of the Columbus Blue Jackets come into the dressing room and he called me and Zenin Kanopka into this room. And he got him, and this is my first year really being in the, in, in the American, you know, dealing with NHL guys. And we got called into a room and I remember Scott Housen started yelling at us and said, we got guys like Derek Broussard and all these guys that are our top round draft picks and they're 165 pounds soaking wet. And if they go out there and warm us with no shoulder pads on and they get hurt, what is that? What's that going to, you're basically telling us that we couldn't go out with, with, with shoulder pads. Eh? So he said, if you guys go out there with shoulder pads, you guys are going to be off this team. So we leave the, we leave the room and I'm, I'm shooting my pants because that's an NHL GM where I want to be at, you know, telling me that we can't wear no, we have to go with our shoulder pads on for, and this is just warm ups. I mean, we're just being stupid. And I look at Kanopka and I say, well, what are we going to do? Like, we can't go out there. He, goes, he looks at me, he goes, fuck him. <laughs> so the entire team went out there with no shoulder pads and no helmets. And, uh, yeah, it, I remember looking up in the, sta- in the at the press box and they were freaking out and livid, but they, they didn't, uh, they didn't, they didn't kick us off the team. I think we went on to win, I think it was 27 games in a row. And, uh, we ended up losing up in the Northern finals against the Toronto Marlies in game seven. That was kind of a shitty feeling, but that year, like I said, we won 27 games. So from Christmas on, we didn't lose a game. And I mean, it was the tightest group of guys and all we did was fight, get suspensions and, and score goals and win. So, I mean, no one could really stop us. I remember even Kanopka, funny story, called uh, Scott Housen and said, uh, or he called somebody in Columbus. Because Z was our captain, right? So he kind of had the, the strings to pull people, to call people. And I remember he, he told them, Columbus, he goes, well, you guys didn't make playoffs. Why don't you let us use the team jet? <laughs> you know, and this is just the shit that that year was all about. It was, it was a lot of fun. And, and uh, 
you know, to this day, we're still a gr tight group of guys that talk to each other. And, and, and we always talked about that one year, how, how good we were and how much fun it was. I'd read an article on that team, and one of the things in it was uh, a little boy's poster that said the climbing in our arena is always nasty. <laughs> yeah, we, we, that was a year. I mean, I remember we had shit our entire management staff shave their mohawks in their hair. And um, <laughs> I mean, we had, we had a night where fans would come and pay us $20 to shave mohawks. Me and Z and a couple of guys would shave mohawks in, the, in fans' hair, and we fundraised money and we sold t-shirts that paid our, our fines that we would get in warmups. And, you know, it was just, it was a wild year and, and, and how much that team gelled. I still remember how we, every player on that team bought into that our into our, our method, right. To play tough. And uh, Derek Broussard was 20 years old or 19 years old, first year pro, you know, going to be pretty much a star in the NHL. And I remember we were playing Manitoba Moose in the first round. And I think it was Brad Moran, he was one of the big wigs in the, in the American League at that time, you know, making 300 grand a year or whatever. And Derek Dorsett off the opening face-off, dropped in his – and Derek Dorsett's – I mean, not, not, not Derek Dorsett, sorry, Broussard. Derek Broussard still plays in the show. Drops his gloves in his helmet and, and tries to square off with this other centerman. And the guy didn't want to fight him, so he just skated away. But, I mean, it just goes to show that even a guy like Derek Broussard bought into the, into the system, right? And he says, ah, fuck, I wanted to fight him and set the tone for the game. And uh, we ended up beating Manitoba Moose in that series and going to, to play. Uh, we ended up losing to Toronto in the finals. So, but it just goes to show you, like, we all bought in. And, and uh, it, it, I mean, I could tell you so many X-rated stories that we got in trouble at bars. And it was a wild gong show year. But we were, we were one of the hottest teams that year. What was your best playing guilty story then? Because obviously you had a, you, playing in the A, um, bouncing around from all these different cities, uh, you must have had a night where you stayed up, you know, a little too late, but had to get up the next day to to perform. Oh shit! I've I've played guilty every time. <laughs> I've I've played guilty so much I can't even remember my best time. I mean, I remember one one funny time was it was actually it had nothing to do with the American League. It was my first year pro. I had uh, we played I think we played Las Vegas in Bakersfield. I was in the East Coast. I was twenty years old and. Uh, I just got called up to California. I actually quit hockey. I quit the Western League, and I was going to go to university. My high school girlfriend was pregnant, and uh, so I, like I said, I'm going to quit, and was going to university in Saskatchewan at U of S, but I got a phone call to go play in Bakersfield. That's how I got my foot in the door in pro. But anyways, uh, long story short is we were – I had played the night before and played a pretty good game and, and uh, got in a fight. I think I actually got a goal my first game pro – and so whatever that was the friday night so the saturday night i know that was it was a saturday night because we had a two o'clock game on sunday and we were playing the anchorage aces the alaska aces and a, a, an ex-teammate of mine that i actually ended up fighting the next day his name was uh mike lee he's a big black guy there he, he, he played in the america played with me in tri cities and so i ended up partying with these guys all night and and I, this was only my first weekend in playing in california and so i was still living at the hotel right beside the arena where all the visiting teams played. So I, I remember the Sunday morning, I get called into the office at like 10 o'clock in the morning. And uh, the coach back then still had the VHS tapes, right? The, the tape, you know, the movies. And he said, press play on there. So I pressed play. And it was a recording of the, uh, the hotel security uh, down the hallway. And uh, I was walking in from room to room with a towel. I was naked with a towel wrapped around me going from room to room, partying with the other team. And, uh, all I remember is he said, you're damn lucky. You played the best weekend of your life. He says, because I'd send you home for this. So they had me on, on, t on security footage going from room to room, you know, partying with the, the visiting team. And I, and, and, uh, so that was probably one of the more funny, embarrassing stories that I, I remember I put my head down. I'm like, I can't believe that's on camera, you know? I guess our coach was friends with the manager at the hotel and the manager gave him this footage of me partying in, in hotel rooms with the other team. So I probably that, killed a few of them up that night though. <laughs> yeah. Good old VHS tapes. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. what, did you think, what did you think of playing in California? I loved it. You know, that's actually where I ended up meeting my wife that I'm with now. And, and uh, I mean, what can you say? I mean, it's California, right? The, going to the rink every day in sandals and beach shorts and, you know, golfing all winter and, and just, you know, living the dream, really. I mean, like I was, uh, joke around with people. I mean, there was a time where I was making $500 a week, and there was times I was making $500 a day. And, 
I remember back then when I was playing in the East Coast, I, I, I was a champ. I loved it. And, you know, it's, I was a rock star. I, I loved it and I enjoyed it. And, and it was just as fun as it was my last year making big money. Well, you've played, you know, when you look at the list of places you've played and you've listed off a bunch of them. Yeah. You got to be the first guy, you know, I know you played in the K. Yeah. But you got to be the first guy I've, I've had on here who's played in Kazakhstan. Yeah, Kazakhstan, the, the movie Borat. <laughs> I've never you ever watched that. Absolutely, yeah. Like, uh, what, I've, what I've, I've never watched it until after I played there, and it just made me laugh because it's kind of like that. But Kazakhstan was awesome. I mean, they. I mean, I have nothing but good things to say about Russia and Kazakhstan. When I was there, I mean, to this day, I have people write me saying, "We miss you. We want you to come back here." And I'm thinking, "Fuck, I can't go back there," you know. But Kazakhstan was a really cool experience. Um, you know, I remember we'd hire. I mean, that was that was the KHL, right? But but the city was based out of Kazakhstan. It was a stand of Kazakhstan. And I would hire, uh, instead of getting a car there, you just pay a driver. Like you'd, you'd get your own personal driver. I mean, we were making a really good chunk of change while we were playing there. So we would hire, I think I hired my driver for like 2,500 bucks a month. And he was, he would basically work for me. So he would drive me around and he didn't speak a word of English and I didn't speak a word of Kazaki. So, you know, we, we just learned to get along in sign language and he'd drive me around and take me when I wanted to get in trouble. And, my my wife would always laugh because he would uh, she goes I can't believe how you guys communicate but we 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 became really good friends he was my driver to like you know if I had to be at practice at ten in the morning he'd I'd say pick me up at eight thirty he'd be down there waiting with a coffee and um, it was just funny to watch us communicate because he didn't like I said he didn't speak English and I you know we just hand language and you know I you know I'd I'd, I'd find a way to communicate with him and and we became best of friends and. You know, even my wife would struggle because when I was gone on the road, you know, she he still had to drive for her, right? So, uh, it's funny that we're talking about all this stuff because a lot of the stuff we just talked about, it was Hun Shatir, was, was the, the big mall. It was like West Edmonton Mall, and that's all Janessa would say is Hun Shatir, and he'd take her to Hun Shatir, and he'd wait outside in the parking lot all day while she shopped. So, um, Kazakhstan was, was quite, a, quite a cool place. When you said to him, or signed to him, I guess, hey, I want to go get in some trouble. Like, is what is trouble in Kazakhstan? <laughs> I don't know. Either fighting or, or girls or I don't know. They just, they just take me and let's have fun or, or, or drink or I don't know. We, he, we found it, though, and he was, my, he was a good wingman. What was uh, maybe one of the things about, you know, going over to Russia, Kazakhstan, that surprised you about the place? Um, I, in a negative way, or not, not even in a negative way, but in a, in a, a way that – really we don't appreciate what we have in Canada that's that's what that that's what I still tell people to this day like just having the luxury to go to this the city convenience or the 7-eleven store at midnight to get a pop and chips you know there's they, we're really lucky to have what we have here there's so much poverty there you know in, in Kazakhstan and Russia I mean bo- they're both pretty much similar there's no middle class you're either wealthy and you, you're hiring people to drive around or you're dirt poor and uh, so, you know, it really made me appreciate what we have here and, you know, going out and, but, but at the same time, you know, it made me respect other people's uh, lifestyles. You know, you go there and, you know, Americans weren't too liked in Russia. And, and I, I, sometimes I get why, because even the, our attitudes, you know, we'd go out to a restaurant and we'd ask for something and they'd say, well, we don't have that. And then we'd get mad and say, well, what the fuck we have that in Canada? You know, we can't, you can't compare countries, right? They're, they're a different, different lifestyle there. So, um, but just how nice they were. I mean, being First Nations, I remember in Russia, I got a, and I party with some pretty big people. I mean, I, I got a party with Vladimir Putin, the, the Russian president. And, you know, when I was in uh, Vitez and Chekhov and by Moscow, that was, he was, uh, he, he flew in like Roy Jones Jr. and some pretty big names because he was his, our owner was, was kind of Russian mob in, in, in Moscow. And he would, he, he was two big sports were boxing and, and hockey. So, of course, me and Yablonski going to his hockey team kind of was a, a match in heaven, right? But uh, just how much they, 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 they actually appreciated us, and especially being First Nations, like they would always be really intrigued about the, the Indians in Canada. So it made me really proud, right, to, to, to see how they, they thought of us and treated us and um, just treated me like gold. I have, like I said, you hear so many bad stories, but I have not one bad thing to say about Russia or Kazakhstan. What, do you, what, did, what was Putin like? I'm a Trump supporter. I, I love Putin, man. It was his way or the highway, you know, and, and he was honest and I, he, I, I, I don't know. I don't want to really get into politics, but you know, he just, <laughs> I like to, I, 
you know, for example, in Canada, you know, we have all these people coming and they want us to live. We have to adapt the way, the way they live, right? You know, they, we, we have to change our, we can't single Canada or whatever. I mean, I don't want to get into it, but, you know, there he just said, he says, we welcome foreigners, but this is Russia. If you're going to move to Russia, you're going to live like a Russian. And, and that's, that's what really stuck to my head. That was his attitude. He says, I'm not against people coming here from, from other countries. He said, but if you're going to come to Russia, you're going to live like a Russian. And that's what I really respected, right? You know, because I just see us trying to change for so many other people. And, you know, they should come here and want to be Canadian. And, and, and that's, that's, that's what stuck out the most about him to me. Well, and I, I, I think uh, you don't have to worry about offending too many people with that statement. I mean, yeah. it's, it, we were talking about before we started. It's in, well, I mean, you look around uh, where you're at, and it doesn't feel like the world is that strange. You go online, and the world gets strange in an awful hurry. The biggest thing I've heard in this last few months is they said if you have, if you don't have internet, you don't have your phone, you don't have TV, the news, would this disease affect you? And I, I I'd say no, it doesn't. It's just yeah. everything you read, and that's what made me mad. You know, being in California, you know, everyone's saying, "Oh, it's it's a it's a it's it's a infested down there. How could you be down there?" And I mean, life was normal and having fun. I mean, I think me, this is more of just a, a political game here. You know, it's it's basically what president you want to get in next year or whatever. So I just I don't know. It's, I I like Trump. Let's just leave it at that. <laughs> and that's pretty rare for a First Nations guy to say. What, uh, you know, over in Russia, were you into the vodka? Oh, was yeah. It, was yeah. it good oh, vodka? I've been, I, was, uh, fair disclosure, I, I, I've been to Finland, so I've been close, but I've never been I, into I Russia. I love it called Beluga. It was the, the whale, the Beluga whale. It was, yeah. It was, a, it was a higher class vodka, but frick, was it good. It was, went down like water. And one thing I learned in Russia is you don't really mix your drinks. Like, you know, guys here will drink vodka and Pepsi or vodka and orange juice. You don't drink vodka there like that. You just do shots. And all you do is you have a chaser. So if you're drinking vodka, you'll have a bottle of vodka and you do shots. And every time you do shots, you, you do a, you honor somebody, right? They, they, that's, they're really into respect like that. So, um, you know, if we were doing a shot, I'd say, okay, to your health. And we do a shot and then you'd follow it with a chaser, but you'd never have a mixed drink. And I remember there was times where I couldn't even remember the night before, but I'd wake up the next day. Like I'd wake up naked on my bathroom floor. <laughs> as funny as it sounds but i but the thing was you wouldn't have a hangover because it was so i don't know just the, the vodka was so smooth and you'd be so drunk you wouldn't remember but you would never wake up with a hangover i was gonna ask how how many bottles of vodka did you go through but you you have no idea anyways <laughs> i have no idea we we went through too many let's just leave it at that did you uh did you do any traveling around like in that area or were you were you playing so much hockey that you didn't have much time to like, I mean, you're on the other side of the world. You got, uh, you know, when you're in uh, Kazakhstan, I mean, geez, I always think of Mongolia is like kind of right beside you. Did you like tour into countries like that? I didn't get to go anywhere like that. Like we, that? Did go to, we, did, we did get to go to Dubai during the, uh, it was the year of the Olympics. So they had a bunch of Olympic breaks for the Olympic team to skate. So the KHL would shut, shut down for like four or five days. So uh, the, the one, the one, it was in, I think it was in like January, they flew with the whole team and wives to Dubai as a vacation, but it wasn't a vacation because we still skated every day and had to run on the beach and do, do workouts. But I mean, it was kind of cool just to travel the world and, and see things like that, right? Because it's not every day that you'll, you'll have that opportunity. So, you know, and then just, you know, on my way home, I stopped and, you know, Riga, Latvia was a beautiful place. Um, Frankfurt, Germany, Prague was beautiful. I mean, there's, like I said, it's just, a, it's a different world over there, right? So it was really fun to see. What what brought you back from the KHL then? Tim Hortons. I was told that I, I was ready to open up my Tim Hortons and I needed to get back. So I, I actually had a year left on my contract and uh, turned it down and just basically revoked it and, and came back to Canada to open my Tim Hortons. And then I got word that my Tim Hortons was going to be delayed another year. And then that's how come I ended up going to play in Quebec for a little bit. But you're not, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you don't have Tim Hortons anymore, right? No, I sold it. I sold the Timmy's. Yeah, I, I actually sold it about three or four years ago. Did just did, uh, did you enjoy having the Tims? I assume I, I gotta assume, and this um, is being naive that uh, Tim Hortons is uh, I'll be a full time job. It, you're married to it, and I think that was the, that was the hardest thing for me. I think was just you know having a young family at that time still, and having to be there eighteen to twenty hours a day. You know, um, it's a completely different lifestyle. You go from playing hockey and making hundreds of thousands of dollars and not really, I, I don't like saying not doing much. Cause I mean, my body paid the price, 
but at the same time, I mean, everything's laid out on a golden platter for you, right? Your, your, your flights, your workouts, your schedules, your hotels, everything's set up for you in, in front of your eyes. And, you know, you come home and you have to put in 20 hours a day working and you're not getting paid as much at that time. You know, it's like, holy shit, is this worth it? And, um, but I, I look at everything like, a, you know, a chapter in a book, you know, that's one chapter in my life. And I moved on to different things and different opportunities and, and it's still cool. I know I still go down as a legacy that I brought the only Tim Hortons to Meadow Lake and, you know, that was something that people wanted for 20, 20 years. So, um, you know, I still go there and get my perks and it's, it's uh, cool to think that I brought it here, but, um, just like I said, it was just one chapter in my life. Funny I don't story. know what else, I, I don't know what else I'm going to get myself into. A, a funny story for you. The first chirp you ever threw at me when you were playing for the Marwang Comets was I own a Tim Hortons. What do you do? And I was like, yeah, I, I don't got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm gonna skate the other way <laughs> yeah i i so I, I only played like two or three games there so yeah, I, one right. of them was, I, I i like to tell joel bud shout out to joel bud that i saved his life because you were in a scrum with him and it looked like you were gonna punch him so all i did was just grab onto your arm and you gave me this stare and then said <laughs> that and i was like yeah i'm good i'm gonna go back to the bench or whatever right like i i, I don't need any more uh, yeah no that was fun too I, i'm really good friends with bj carey so, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of how I ended up going there and, and, uh, play. I think, I don't, I don't think I got to play many games there though. It's, it's real. It was really hard. Like I said, I was in a point in my life now where things were just kind of changing and, and I didn't have as much free time. So, but it was always fun to play with a few of those guys. You know, you, uh, you got to play with another team that has come up on a podcast before I interviewed, um, Brad Crookshank and he'd played for the motor city maniacs back in, uh, 0405 lockout and i didn't realize yeah. it but you were the on danbury trashers the danbury trashers yeah we were probably the toughest team in hockey um yeah that was a that was a good year that was a year that the, the nhl lockout was on i was actually that was after my first year pro i played in bakersfield and i i had an awesome rookie year in the east coast i actually got called by the blackhawks to go to camp and all that right and so i was all pumped to go try play try out for chicago and that so happened in June or whatever, the, the NHL decided that they were going to do a lockout. So it kind of screwed my plans over. And uh, Jimmy Galante was a, in Google, or there's a thing on Sports Illustrated. He was a, I guess you could say, an Italian mafia. Um, you know, to this day, I'm still close to AJ's son. Um, it was a, well, quite an experience. You know, I, I wasn't watching the movie Sopranos, but from what I hear, Sopranos and, and, and our team in, in Danbury were pretty much go hand in hand. Um, we had Frank Bialois, we had Garrett Burnett, we had Brad Wingfield, who's still a really good friend of mine, Steve and Pete. I mean, we, we had, they didn't care. They had so much money. They didn't care who they called. They just said, Hey, you want to come play and name a price and you come, you know? And I mean, I, <laughs> I'm not supposed to, I mean, that team was investigated by the FBI and stuff, but there were guys making four or five, six hundred thousand dollars a year. And this is only double A pro hockey, right? These guys are only supposed to be making anywhere from twenty five to thirty five thousand a year. Um, you know, we lived in cabins on on uh, New Fairfield, Connecticut, which is the 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 richest um, ca- uh, the richest county in the country. I mean, we had million dollar cabins along the lake, and we didn't pay rent. And it was it, it was an experience, man. It was awesome. And he ran a it was just like the movies. He ran a uh, a, a trashing company. The Danbury Trashers, yeah, and it was, you know, that was another chapter in my life, you know, like I said, this book's going to be long, but it's still going. I swear to God, there has to be a great story from playing in Danbury. You got to have one that you're just like, like, you, you've said a couple times here, whether it's in the KHL, now Danbury, a couple times the mob comes up and I'm like, I don't even, I don't even think the regular person knows what to make of that, right? Like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah well that's why i laugh i do a lot of work back home now with all these little gangsters here in in town and i to me i laugh because I, I i got some stuff that i probably can't even say on here about that i've dealt with or was or was around um so when you see these kids talking about their little gangsters with their you know pepper spray or little knives i i was with uh you know when i played in quebec we had the hell's angels all surrounded by us you know when i was in in uh, danbury connecticut it was the italian mafia you know and then when i went to uh to Russia, it was the Russian mob. So, you know, there's, I was with some pretty big organizations and, you know, there's, there's stories here I could tell you all night and maybe we'll save some of those for, for when I come down to Lloyd and, and have a talk. That sounds cool. I got to ask then, did it, at any point 
with all those different organizations surrounding what you're doing, was it ever uncomfortable or was it like, nah, man, this is like, take care of us. And, and it was good. No, uh, not really. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm a, never been into to rough stuff. Like I've always been pretty, pretty even head on my shoulders. So, you know, like, and, and, and especially being in Quebec, I was a, I was a bad, you know, there was a time, a couple of years there where me and Steve Bossy were probably the two, two baddest men on ice. And, and, and they loved us, right? The, the bikers loved us because of who we were and what we did. And I mean, so you'd go to a bar and you'd be VIP with them, but I was never a guy that would really buy into them. You know, I, they, they'd order me a bunch of drinks. I would never, I would take them, but I'd always turn around and order them a bunch of drinks. So I never, so I, you know, I just never wanted to have, owe any, owe anything to anybody. And, uh, same thing, you know, in, in Russia, same thing, just, you know, I respected them. They respected me. I've never been, and that was probably a bad downfall in my career was I've never been an ass kisser. You know, if you like me for who I am, I'll like you for who for you are. And, and, uh, you know, if you didn't like me, then I didn't like you. So, uh, yeah, it just, like I said, I just, the kind of person I am, I didn't really get too involved with them. I mean, I was around them. I've seen a lot of shit, but I never, uh, never got myself into, into deep. Talking about the, the LNAH, the Quebec yeah. Fighting League, um, was that enjoyable? Was that like, was that a fun league? Cause I, I think it was, I had Kurt Benzmiller on here once upon a time and he talked about going out there and some of the, just the craziness of it. I mean, you played in yeah. a lot of years on and off. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, Kurt, I think only played a couple games there. A couple games. That's I right. I don't think he was cut out for that league. I mean, that's a, <laughs> I don't think he was tough enough or I don't know if he had it, to, to, but yeah, it's, it's, it's not an every man's league, man. It's, it's, it's wild, but it's not as wild as it's said. Like, if you're if you're a goal scorer and you take a guy over there to go play, you're not that goal scorer is not going to hurt. There was bench brawls, but when I would jump on the ice to go kill somebody, I wasn't trying to go kill us. Like I was going after the other tough guy. So usually the, the goal scorers would grab each other and basically hug and kiss, and it would be it would be guys like me going around trying to make a statement, right? So, I mean, you rarely. Like guys, like there was times I'd try to bring some of my my guys that were were skilled guys. I'd say, let's go, and they were so scared to go. But they, I was actually the, the one year that I was there, I was it was really impressed with the skill level. I bet you that year, if it was us in St. John, if you took the, us two teams, we were like an American League team. Like we had, we were probably scarier because our fourth line was made up of straight meat, right? But uh, I mean, your first and second line, all those guys had played in the NHL or the AHL. The only difference was they were a bit older and had jobs at home now and work. But like, I mean, that those years we were, it was good hockey. I remember we were playing because there was a lockout that year because that was towards the end of the year of Danbury that we would play in the Quebec the old, the old the old Quebec Stadium. You know, that's an NHL rink, and I mean that rink would be full and and the fans there loved it. I mean, so to me, I, it, it had a rough, it has a rough reputation, but it, it was awesome. I mean, I enjoyed it. It was professional. I was. I've seen some bad things where guys, you know, but I was, when I was there, I was such a kind of a high player in demand. I, I brought in a lot of fans and, you know, when I traveled on the road, I was a, a big draw. So I was always treated first class and, you know, I got paid good money and, and got treated first class and always same thing. I had nothing bad to say about that place. You know, you hear stories negative about Russia or about Quebec, but you know, I guess, I guess when you're valuable to them, you're treated well, right? I mean, maybe went there now and I'm out of shape and can't do what I used to do, then maybe I won't be treated as good. But, you know, like I said, I have nothing bad to say about pretty much any place I've played. Um, who is maybe one of the best players then you've been on the ice with? I mean, you've, you've played a lot of different spots. You've seen a yeah. lot of different talent. Who's one of the guys that stuck out to you? I always, this story gets asked. I mean, I didn't play, play with them. But I remember the, the the one guy that I just would play against, and I couldn't believe how good he was. And I I got to play a couple of games against Ovechkin, and I got to play a couple of games against um, uh, Even, Evgeny Malkin. Okay. And, and uh, but the one guy that I went wow was that Alexander Radulov. Really? I for mean, Dallas. For Dallas, but I when when he was in, he was just so dominant. Guys would you'd hammer him, but the puck would never leave him. Like he would just. You, you, he'd get crushed everywhere, but the puck would never leave a stick. And he'd get up and keep going. I don't know why. Like I said, I know just from stats, you're going to say, of course, Ovechkin's better. Or, you know. But then I remember playing against uh, Malkin, and I remember he split our two demon. I still remember it fell on his knees and still put it crossbar in. 
So, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to say one guy's better than the other. I mean, they're all fucking good. Yeah, they're all talented. But I just remember looking at Radulov and going, wow, fuck, you can't even get him off. Like, he just bounced off you and would keep going. Well, it's slowly getting dark on us, so I want to slide into the Crude Master Final Five, the last segment, and then we'll, if you're in Lloyd, we'll saddle you up here at the studio. We'll have a cocktail, and we'll, we'll uh, pick your brain on some mob stories. But until then, let's get into the Crude Master Final Five. Just five quick questions, long or short as you want to go, John. Um, yep. If you were getting in a line brawl tomorrow and yeah. could have one guy on your side, who would you take? Shit, I got two really good buddies. And uh, I would have to say, can I take two? Can we, can we change it to two guys? Sure, let's let's put and, two. And this is fighting against any other tough, toughest guys in the NHL. I would take Dean Mayran, and I would take Brad Wingfield. Dean, Dean Mayran was the guy that played in Quebec with me. I never fought him. He was actually on my team. But he was the guy that won the hockey enforcers. Remember they had a thing 10 years ago in Prince George? Yeah, that's right. Big, Big man, six five, tough as nails. Um, big teddy bear if you really know him. Uh, he actually lives up in Coal Lake now. He could, you know, and uh, so that's Dean Mayer and I'd take, and then Brad Wingfield. They called him Wingnut, and I played with him in Danbury. And uh, shit, I don't know if he, if, he, if he can't beat you up with his fist, he'll find something else to beat you up with. So I, right beside me, <laughs> guys in that that case. So uh, and and then like I said, both those guys. And, and the funny story, I want to throw this in there, too, is, is both those guys hated me. Because I, I, I never fought either one of them, but they were always on my team. But both guys hated me because I'm a lot younger than them, right? So I came in as the young tough, and they were the old veteran tough guy. And they probably said, oh, who the fuck is this kid, you know? And to this day, they still tell me they know why I was talking now because, you know, going being to, to be in a serious issue, you know, is your, your head's a powerful thing. And, and I look back and I go, fuck, I was cocky. And I don't really like that. To be honest, when I was fighting guys that were sick, like Steve McIntyre's or Derek, you know, those guys are big men and they're tough. But if I didn't go in there with a mentality that I'm tough and I'm, you know, I used to tell myself I'm the toughest guy on the ice, you know. And I'm was they? Probably not. But it just, you know, if you go into a fight saying, fuck, I'm going to get beat up. I'm going to lose. I'm not tough. Guess what? You're probably going to get beat up, you know. So so that's why I always had that that cocky attitude just to, to, to make myself, you know, go. So those are the two guys. I would take Brad Wingfield and, and Dean Mayron. Well, these might these names might come up for the next two questions. And say so what number two is which tough guy was the best to go for beers with? The best guy to go to for beers with. Um probably Zenin Kanopka. You know, Z was Z Z Z liked the party. Z reminded me he's a I always called Z a white Indian. He partied like me with me, like I would party back in the reserve. But he was a white guy, and and we had some good stories. I remember. Uh, I mean, I don't. I guess we only got five minutes, but one story pops to mind when we were in a bar, and some young guy got called up to us. He was from the East Coast, and he got called up to the American League. And I mean, me and Z were like the two older, you know, veteran leader guys, and the guys you wanted to kind of associate be, be around because we were we were popular. And this young goalie came up to us. And I don't even remember the kid's name, but he said, "I want to go buy you guys a shot." And me and Z, we, we, we could drink, right? And so this kid buys us a shot. So, you know, we do the shot with the kid. And he's like, oh, awesome, thank you. And then the kid tries to leave. He goes, Z goes, no, 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 get back here. He said, you're going to buy us a drink. We're going to buy you a drink now. But Z ordered a freaking 20. To, and Z would always order like wild, was it, is it called wild turkey? I used no. to hate it. <laughs> yeah, it's wild that turkey. Was, yeah, absolutely. Oh, well, it was disgusting. But he would order like 20 of them and we'd sit there and drink it. So the kid was, you know, didn't want to tell us no. So they're sitting there drinking these shots with us, but he ends up, while we're not looking, he's spilling his shots. And this is our teammate. And anyways, Z ended up catching the kid, dump his shots, and Z grabs him by the throat and is like trying to choke the kid. The kid's scared. And all the bouncers come running over, but the bouncers knew who we were, so they're like trying to back off. And I'm like, Z, I said, let go of the kid. <laughs> but I mean, that's, he was just a wild, he was a wild party guy and, 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 had, and a great guy, you know, so he was, he was fun to drink with. If you could sit across from uh, any guy or woman, for that matter, like I'm yeah. doing with you, who would you take? Who would I take? Donald Trump. The Trump. <laughs> the Trumpster. <laughs> the Trumpster. I think I would. Yeah, I don't know. Before I would have asked for someone cool, but I think it'd be cool to talk to that guy. <laughs> he's what? he's he's so hated, but he's also loved by others. So I don't know. It's I, I don't know. I, I think that'd be kind of cool to say I got a party with Donald Trump, or at least talk to Donald Trump. 
What's one league you never played in that you wish you could have? I would like, well, obviously the NHL. I would have loved to play full time in the NHL. I mean, but you know, I came in at a late time, and and my size might hurt me and my skating. But um, if you weren't to say the NHL, I don't know. I think I played in a lot of good leagues. Okay, finally, then your last one is the best establishment. What is one of what is the the hole in the wall? The the if you're in Cleveland, Chicago, Miami, wherever it is, if you're in Kazakhstan. Where, where is the one place that uh, people got to stop in to have a brewski at? I'm going to promote my hometown. Can I do that? Absolutely. Dorntosh. The, uh, the Dorntosh bar? Parkland Inn. Yeah. Owner is Brent Tivach. <laughs> that, that, hey, nothing wrong with that. that, <laughs> probably, weird, that I've one, been eh? there. I've been there. Well, you've been there, yeah. I mean, it's a steak night. I would bring all my buddies from the States that would come and visit me, and we'd go to Parkland on a steak night and – you cook your own steaks and it's, I mean, it's, it's awesome. You got deer heads hanging all over and you know, <laughs> yeah. you got some of my, yeah, you might see the, you might see the odd little fight in there and you know, you know, so yeah. It's Great awesome. little spot. Well, I, I, like I say, the lights are slowly going out on you. I assume that's the curtain call. So what we'll do is uh, the next time you're down on Lloyd, we'll, we'll have you in the studio where light you can, we can sit here all night and uh, we'll make sure the, the beer fridge is full and we'll have a, a BS session. Maybe m get Mr. Carey in on it too then. Yeah, let's bring that let's bring that guy in there. Let's talk about him and his, his, his fighting days. <laughs> sure, yeah. sounds like a plan. Well, thanks again for hopping on, John. All right, bro, man, it was awesome. Hey, folks, thanks again for joining us today. If you just stumble on the show and like what you hear, please click subscribe. Remember, every Monday and Wednesday, a new guest will be sitting down to share their story. The Sean Newman Podcast is available for free on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and wherever else you find your podcast fix. Until next time.